is one of my main current projects. Uh, one is to uh, study the effect of assessments in the tumor environment. And then within the Lucian project, uh, I have both the optimization and partner session with some interactions and the actual sample acquisition and patient pool. So, so we're going to be talking about the last two. Um, this is the end of this first day. We're going to be doing a quick background where we're going to be talking about results about this impact. Tissue workflow, validation of cell separation, and um, model building and drug testing. So, so quickly, we have some carcinoma. Uh, a subtype is three or seven groups of carcinoma. That's a major subtype, and that's the one that we're going to be talking about. On. That's the third most common generator in our malignancy in the US, and some features that make it very unique is that it's a very highly vascularized type of tumor and very heterogeneous which makes it usually resistant to conventional chemotherapy and makes patients have an oncologist response for like first line treatments. Something that is also very interesting about cell carcinoma is that it is a classic example of the Wormore effect in which the um, tumor cells proliferate to a point where the availability of um, I don't know how it is Sorry. There's a metabolic shift in which cells start using glucose via a glucose pathway rather than the mitochondrial uh, pathway. And then uh, bunch of hypoxia and gradients are prominent in this environment, which makes a very harsh environment and hence generate a high mutagenic rate. And it also um, increases neovascularization of nearby blood vessels, which means that in our models, both the tumor component and the vessel component are going to be important. So I just said that most RCC tumors are resistant to conventional therapy. So the way we treat them is by using anti-angiogenics. A uh, quick reminder about how the angiogenesis process works. It starts with the activation of the vessel via uh, growth factors such as VEGF, and then those cells start degrading the basement membrane, and they start proliferating migrating, and, and eventually there's a new vessel that gets stabilized, pruned, and matures. So the, what the uh, anti-angiogenics do is they prevent the binding of VEGF to the receptors, or else they stop the cascade uh, downstream of VEGF receptors or like receptors. So our goal is to uh, use these kind of treatments in a Luminex model to try to um, make personalized medicine with it. So uh, we, the, for this project, we have five different goals, and I'm just going to be talking about them for the first today. First one is to isolate <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> both the endothelial and the epithelial components from the individual patients. Use these uh, fractions to construct both energetic models, and then test different drugs with it. With the output that we get from this drug testing, we'll correlate the drug response with the um, outcome of the patient. And then with all this information, we aim to try to understand the uh, interactions happening in the model so that we can kind of infer biomarkers to try to predict uh, whether a certain patient is going to be responsive or no to a particular drug. So the way we're going to be doing this in the Mushab project is we're going to be selecting certain patients we're going to be um, performing PSMA PET imaging on them, which I'm going to be talking about later, before and after treatment. And then if the tumor recurs, we will image again. Then uh, part of the treatment is a nephrectomy, which means that we're going to be getting a bunch of tissue from these patients. We're going to be uh, mincing it and separating it into two different fractions. The CD31 uh, negative, meaning the epithelial component, and the CD there one positive, so we end with the component. We're going to be building our luminance models with them, and then we're going to be using a bunch of different endpoints. And at the end, we'll compare the outcome of the patient with the outcome of our model, and hopefully they match. So we're going to be talking about the uh, first involvement of um, this project, which is going to be patient 102. Uh, this was a female with clear cell growth of carcinoma between her lip kidney and a superclavicle metastasis detected via MRI. And this was initially treated with hysterectomy of the disease kidney. Now, I have gotten a uh, disclaimer that I'm going to give you guys too that this information that's coming after this is going to be sensitive, so please do not send me it. 
So I was talking about how we're going to be doing a kind of imaging called KISS-A impact on these patients. So this kind of imaging is based on kiss and a or prostate-specific membrane antigen. This is a kind of like protein found in constitutively in kidney, uh, salivary glands, um, also the prostate. Um, we don't really know what it does, but we also know that it's found in renal cancers in a smaller level where the expression increases, but it's not necessarily correlated with tumor aggressiveness, metastatic disease, and disease recurrence. Now, the interesting thing about this particular antigen is that we can use inhibitors to detect it, and then the inhibitors are internalized and they're safe code, meaning that we can use this for imaging and to detect where this primary disease or this metastatic disease is located by using a four direct isotope, which is going to be the basis of our imaging. So these are the images for our first patient. On the left, we're looking at MRI, and then this is the PSMA patch. As you can see, okay, so the um, the way the patient is located for these images is the head will be sticking into the screen and then the feet will be sticking out, meaning that this would be the patient's left, patient's right. So this is a uh, cut of the image at the height of the kidneys. As you can see, this is the regular kidney, the one that's not diseased, and this is the other kidney which is diseased. Now, by MRI, we can only detect that it's obviously large, but by using the PSMA patch, we can detect that this one, which is fine, the kidney that's fine, has a very high expression of PSMA. As I was saying, PSMA is considerably expressed in kidneys, but then there's also a minor expression in the primary tumor. And in this case, it's very interesting because this um, methodology allows us to discriminate the uh, probably healthy tissue from the necrotic pore, which is cold, from the androgenic and growing outer rim of the tumor. And over here, we have the same picture not annotated in kind of a reddish color, so like a heat map, where you can probably see better than that. And it's interesting to see that if we look at the whole image of the patient, there is a gap happening over there, which constitutes the cold part or the part of tissue in the tumor, which I found very interesting. Okay, so if we move on and explore other parts of this patient's anatomy, we can see that in the clavicle, we can still detect that signal. This is the supraclavicular metastatic portion that was detected via fMRI. But if you see over here, apart from the primary tumor and this part, we can pinpoint a possible other site of metastasis close to the spine. If you're wondering what these um, uh, values are, they indicate how strong the signal is, and this is how it's defined. We're not going to be talking about that so much. But the interesting thing is that we can, with a very high uh, degree of certainty and um, uh, accuracy, detect possible other spots of metastasis that would otherwise not be um, detectable via a conventional MRI, which is where this technique actually shines. And this is the metastasis on the spine, close to the spine. You can see some signal happening over here as well. And this is a signal that we can only see via PSMA PET, but not via conventional MRI. Okay, so we have um, accrued the images for the first patient, and this patient went, underwent the nephrectomy for the deceased kidney. So from the tissue now, um, we can isolate the epithelial and endothelial fractions, and then see what happens. I already showed you guys this image, um, which is an image of Parsons for CD31, FM, C58, and nucleus and F acting. And bottom line of this is we can um, detect CD31 strongly in the endothelial fractions, not in the epithelial fractions, meaning that we actually have pretty good populations for both fractures that we were expecting to get. So we can continue on with making our model. Before we do that, I'm going to do a really quick overview of um, the growth factor pathways that start angiogenesis, which is also going to give us an idea of what we're expecting to see upregulated in the tumor tissue. So growth factors are going to find their receptors, and then they're going to start a whole bunch of different downstream pathways 
which eventually are going to lead to an increased migration, focal logistics and permeability of the um, tumor, um, tumor and the cell, cell vessels that we build. And we're also going to see increased proliferation, survival, angiogenesis, and innovation of those. So is that what we see? Um, for that, we built both normal and tumor individual vessels in lumen models, and we compared the organization, the coverage of the lumens, and the um, angle at which the cytoskeleton of each of these cells within the lumen were oriented. And we saw that, in fact, yes, there are more gaps in tumor and vestibular lumens. Um, <coughs> the cells are located toward all different directions. So if we calculate the angle the cells are facing toward, we can see that for normal endothelial lumens, they're all pretty aligned. So most of them are at 90 degrees from the axis, meaning parallel to the lumen, whereas there's a whole variety of directions that they can go in the tumor associated ones. So we can say that our tumor endothelial vessels do indeed look leaky. And if we look at a higher magnification, we can find these leaky spots there and there, but not appear really in the normal endothelial movements, which is good. It means that we can, in fact, um, mimic some of the behaviors that we're seeing for both normal and tumor endothelial movements. So we were saying that they look leaky, but that are they in fact leaky would be our next question. So to do that, we did diffusion um, assays with a 40 kilogram uh, built up with dextrin in both normal and tumor um, endothelial cell lumens. And as you can see, there is a fair retention of the dextrin in normal endothelial cell lumens, whereas tumor endothelial cell lumens are a mess. Um, if we uh, plot the profile of the fluorescence for each of them, as you can see, there is a very high retention in the normal ones, whereas a big part of the dextrin has um, that fused out in the tumor ones. And if we calculate the permeability, as we can see, the permeability of normal and normal vessels is very low. <coughs> and for tumor and the lumens, it would be located between empty ones and the normal and normal ones. And these differences are, in fact, significant. Okay, so we have already demonstrated that we can mimic a couple of different behaviors happening between normal and tumor endothelial lumens. We want to have another better look at them because some of the um, literature on these lumens report that the um, metabolism rate happening between the trunk, trunk of the lumen and the sprout is different as well because these cells require a lot more glucose and energy to sprout out. As you can see, we have over here a 40x um, magnification image of one of our sprouts, and over here would be the lumen, and these are the collagen fibers. And over here we have a flint image. So if you look at this with hopeful eyes, and I have, but we have to confirm this, we see more green vesicles happening over here, and maybe less happening in the sprout, which would mean that, yes, in fact, they have different kinds of metabolism happening between the different two parts. Um, we're going to be confirming this um, not far from now, and then we're going to be looking at proliferation and avoidance of that mechanism next. But something else that I was interested in was in kind of checking the differences between the different patients, because I have seen that for some older patients, normal lithosis look really good, as we already described. Mm -hmm. Tumor and the cells look indeed disorganized, but there was not much sprouting going on. Whereas for patient 51, I showed you a while ago that I did have sprouting. And I found this interesting. So I was also interested to see whether these were actually different from each other, as well as uh, to see whether there were big differences happening between patients, which would justify the personalized medicine approach. So to do that, I did a um, PCR panel to try and discriminate what the uh, differences in gene expression between normal and tumor endothelial cells were and then between patients. So um, what I did was I took those genes that were significantly different between normal and tumor endothelial cells and then I grouped them by angiogenic, meaning they promote angiogenesis, or angiostatic, meaning they um, prevent angiogenesis. And as you can see over here, 
or torn with the little cells, angiogenic genes are upregulated or switched on, whereas in normal epithelial cells they are unregulated or switched off. And the opposite happens for angiostatic ones. So in tumor endothelial cells, they're switched off, and in normal endothelial cells, they're switched on. Meaning that, yes, in fact, we have a pro-angiogenic um, profile going on, or even if we don't really see a sprouting response happening. So then I moved on and I looked at P51, so patient 51 um, uh, gene expression, and I found that there were First, a lot more heads, and then when I organized them by angiogenic and angiostatic, I saw that there were a lot more pro-angiogenic than angiostatic heads. Um, if you remember, I've talked about angiogenesis in the past as being a balance between angiogenic and angiostatic factors. So for patient 51, we would have a lightly weight balance toward angiogenesis with a few factors that promote angiogenesis, and then a few inhibitor factors that would promote angiostasis. So leaning toward angiogenesis overall a little bit, but for patient 51, we would have a ton of pro-angiogenic factors happening and just a few angiostatic factors inhibited. Meaning that yes, in fact we have um, a genetic signature for both normal and tumor endothelial cells. Tumor endothelial cells lumens have a more pro-angiogenic signature. Uh, P41 cells had a higher pro-angiogenic potential and then these results reflect both inter and intra-patient variability. To me, this was also a confirmation that, yes, the tumor tissue that we sampled and the normal adjacent tissue that we sampled give, in fact, totally different populations. So it's kind of a confirmation that, yes, we are taking the right thing over here to build our models. And then hopefully these QPCR panels will could help us identify genetic signatures which are more likely to respond or maybe not respond to a particular drug. Okay, so we have been talking about the endothelial compartment so far, but as I was discussing in the beginning, for these uh, models we anticipate that the tumor is going to play a, a very significant role, so that's what we're going to look at right now. Um, the theory says that once a tumor mass reaches a critical mass, uh, so to say, there is going to be a hypoxia gradient going on, which is going to increase the secretion of growth factors such as VEGF, which are going to in turn increase angiogenesis near by vessels. So the first thing we looked at was whether we could achieve this kind of hypoxia in a, our uh, Luminix model. So for that, what we did was we took a whole lot of cells, embedded them in, co in collagen, and put them into a lumen and then use a fluorescent recording to look at uh, the hypoxia signal. So basically, I added the reporter, I waited, I took pictures, and as you can see, the reporter signal goes up over time, between zero and 24 hours. Um, now, if you're not really familiar with this, um, with this reporter, it's not super sensitive, I meaning this is as good as it gets. So we have a very nice hypoxia going on over here, which actually increases over 24 hours. So yes, we can achieve hypoxia in our tumor fraction in a Luminex model. But the next question is, is it going to have a, an effect at the distance? Is it actually going to secrete growth factors that may have an effect in our um, angiogenesis model? So to answer this question, I did a MAC mix assay and I compared monoculture uh, lumens, so meaning tumor endothelial lumens alone, with a co-culture of tumor endothelial cells and tumor epithelial cells. So say. And, and I compared the secretions of pro-androgenic factors, and as you can see, in the co-cultures, VEGF A and VEGF C were uh, significantly increased, meaning that, yes, there is an increase in the secretion of growth factors due to the fact that we put these two cell types together. Okay. So good, they're doing things together, but this is actually is this actually contributing to a higher angiogenic spreading or no? So to do that, I compared the number of sprouts and their length between monoculture and co-culture, and you're gonna have to believe me on this because this is very subtle over here. But the number of sprouts happening in the co-culture was higher than in the monoculture, and their length was also bigger. 
mean that yes, the cult culture is actually doing things. It's promoting a baseline that's stronger in the androgenic sprouting, which is going to be important for those movements that on their own do not sprout so that we can actually compare the response when we add the drugs with before. Okay, so we have our model. Let's say some drugs. So we did that in patient 102, our patient one from the Moonshot project. So we, um, I followed this um, workflow in which I made endothelial and epithelial monocultures and then the co-culture. I did it for a couple of days and then at day three I took the before picture. I, I collected condition media and then I also um, added our anti-androgenics at a fairly high concentration to make sure that those actually reach the model and they reach um, the different lumens that are going on over there. And then at day six, I took the after image, and right now I'm working on doing the person's qPCR on the um, endothelial lumens resulting from this. And then as a G6P measurement, which would tell us whether these drugs are actually having a cytotoxic effect on the tumor or not so much. So these are the preliminary results for this. As you can see, so I put the circles because you have to believe me every time I bring pictures, so might as well. Um, for the control, we only see a small number of sprouts going on, but when we add the anti-androgenic agents, the number of sprouts actually goes up. So when we quantified this, <coughs> we saw that this difference is in fact significant and happens throughout um, all the assays that we tested. And it's actually higher for a calosantinib, and it doesn't really affect the length of the sprout so much, uh, only maybe in calosantinib a little bit, but overall, this patient would be a non responder to anti androgenic treatments. So I kind of went already through the conclusions of the um, work that I've done. So some future directions would be to try to explore the role of the immune system in the tumor microenvironment for RCC. As some of you may know, there's recently been a change in the standard of care. So a lot of um, patients that would potentially be coming to us and getting anti-androgenics are instead getting um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which means that we it would be very interesting to test those in some of our models, but in the model that we're um, studying right now, we can't. And of course, it would be nice to have an enrollment boost, because right now it's been 1.5 patients, because we have one pulled out. And then I'll be happy to take your suggestions of future endpoints or things that would be interesting to look at. And thank you, everyone, and especially to my undergrad troop. that's probably not a major component of what's going on. Um, actually, if we look back into the second harmonic image, you can see that they don't really degrade that much. They seem to kind of be sneaking into the collagen fibers, so they mostly use them for support, and the difference in stiffness is very small, so I'm actually not that surprised to see that. Um, that's okay. The second question is about the drug testing kind of mm -hmm. um, Is there a reason why you saw more sprouts with the anti Right, I did forget to say that. Um, there was a lot to talk about today. So we have seen in the past that this happens. Um, there's a lot of redundancy between these pathways. So we we have seen that there's also a lot of resistance happening. So if you can. 